writing instrument, please. Uh, if uh, you're technologically savvy, I want you to go to the note-taking section uh, in your device, your smartphone. Uh, there's some jewels that I want to uh, give you on today. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official who had gone to Jerusalem to worship. He was on his way, was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. I, I want to uh, preach, teach, share, impart, use as a subject this morning, I'm not going to chase you. I am not going to chase you. In yesteryear, every television station on Saturday morning used to air animation. And now it's just infomercials. You knew the cartoons were over when Soul Train would come on. One of the earliest to hit syndication before Bugs Bunny, Popeye the Sailor Man, or Mighty Mouse, was in fact Wiley E. Coyote and the Roadrunner. And I want to uh, give you a different perspective on Wiley E. Coyote and the Roadrunner on the day that I'm not sure that you have ever considered or deconstructed. The Roadrunner, Wiley E. Coyote, debuted in 1949. The plot was quite simple with very little twist to catch the road one. Every Saturday morning, you got up with a bowl of cornflakes, frosted flakes, Cheerios, Fruit Loops, sat at the edge of your bed with onesies on, and you watched the road runner and Wiley e. Coyote. It's hard to believe that uh, Friends, it's hard to believe, I don't know whether you know it or not, but there are only 48 episodes. There are 48, only 48 episodes, and uh, it's been on for 71 years. <laughs> for 71 years, they have been playing the same 48 episodes. What, what, what's dumbfounding is that um, that's uh, 71 years and he never caught him. And what's dumbfounding is that he had all the tools, all the equipment, and still never prevailed. Almost as a shout out to AMEs, he used anvils, he used balloons, Use fans, use bird seed, use glue, use grease, use boulders, use bumblebees, use invisible paint, use missiles, use traps, use acme boxes, and still never caught them. There are those of you who have found yourselves as an eternal contestant on Trivial Pursuit but you never catch up with what you're going after, even though you got all the tools. You got charisma, you got charm, you got intelligence, you have depth, you have education, you have integrity, you have gifts, you have anointing, you have wit, you have discipline, you have character, and still, you haven't been able to catch what you've been going after. Wiley Coyote has spent 71 years of his life with one goal in mind, which was to get the road runner. Everybody in this room, 72 to 17 to seven, we've all watched it, been entertained by it, and even laughed at it, but never got the full understanding of the lesson. And today in this 7.30 service, in route to communion, I want to give you the lesson that you watched but didn't see. If God wants you to have it, the question I've got to ask you, if God wants you to have it, 
Why is it running from you? Somebody write that down, please. God wants you to have it. Why is it running from you? In this instance, for new age believers who are watching online, this defies your so-called law of attraction. The question is, why did the coyote want it? Uh, and in wanting it, he didn't want to keep it, he wanted to devour it. The devil comes to steal, to kill and destroy. Jesus advised, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And so we're unsure in this animation which is the devil, the road runner or the coyote? Who is being pursued and who's giving chase? You are chasing some stuff for the wrong reason. Going after money just for material gain and not for community impact. You chase a job simply for prestige and not to open doors of opportunity for others. You're chasing the person, watch this, and you're chasing it because of what they represent and not for who they really are. You have become enamored by a mirage because you don't really know them, you just like the projection. Hear me very carefully, I am not telling you not to go after what you want in life. But the question that I want to ask your critical mind is why are you chasing what doesn't want you? There's an incredible quote by Nora Roberts. Here's what Nora Roberts says. If you don't go after what you want, you'll never have it. If you don't ask the question, the answer will always be no. If you don't step forward, you'll stay in the exact same place. The Coyote friends made four critical mistakes in the chase. And I want you to write these four things down. The four mistakes that the Coyote made in the chase that I don't want you to replicate in 2018. Here's the first one. And this lesson may not even be for you. This lesson may be for your child. This lesson may be for your best friend may be for your coworker, but I want you to write it down. Some of them, you won't even be able to make eye contact with me. Just keep your head down uh, in writing. And we, we all go into communion in just one moment, uh, but I want you to have it. Uh, the first mistake the coyote made, I want you to please have this. He wanted somebody, this is in old school language, he wanted somebody who was fast. Y'all will get it in a minute. wanted somebody that was fast. And here's the problem when you look at that cartoon, some of y'all are gonna have to go back uh, on Hulu and watch it on Netflix again. Here's what is amazing, hear this at 7.30, is the road runner was exhilarated by the chase. The road runner only made noise and only smiled when it was being chased. The road runner was going fast, but never going anywhere. Please, whatever you do, don't go after somebody who's always running. Because <laughs> it's not just you, many times they're running from life. They're running from obligation, running from responsibility. And God forbid, if they're running from their call. If I had time, I'd talk to you about Jonah, but I want to get you to the communion table. First mistake the coward made is he wanted somebody who was fast. Number two, I want you to write this down. Second mistake that the coyote made, hear this very carefully, is the coyote never caught up with himself. Never caught up with himself. 71 years. He spent more 
than half a century chasing and was so embroiled in the chase, he didn't realize he wasn't eating. You can't let years of your life, 90 of y'all need to write this down, you can't let years of your life go by without you finding fulfillment. You could have money and still not be happy. You have a 10,000 square foot house and never make it a home. 71 years chasing the same thing. If he caught it, he would be too tired to enjoy it. God, whatever you do, please don't let me expend all of the valuable energy and resource of my life chasing something that when I get it, I won't be able to appreciate it. Maybe you all forgot he's chasing the roadrunner in a desert. I am expending energy, and the energy I am expending is depleting me. Should not the thing I am going after be able to resuscitate me? Number three, please. The coyote, watch this, used himself, used his stuff and never himself. Used his stuff to catch the road runner, but never used himself. Pastor, what do you mean? So many of us get addicted to the products from acne. And we forgot that we are our greatest commodity. If you got to use a car to get them, you'll never keep them. <laughs> Y'all not saying nothing to me. If the only thing they are attached to is your figure, it won't last. Y'all done got real quiet on me here. If they only see you with makeup on, look straight ahead, please. If you need a weave to feel beautiful. If the only thing you can talk about is your degrees, then you are using all of the stuff the coyote used. And at the end of the day, you're still going to be empty-handed. Who are you with nothing? <laughs> and if they can't love you with nothing, they don't deserve you with everything. You got to be careful of those who fall in love during tax season. <laughs> it, it done got quiet right through here. The fourth thing, and I want you to have this please, is that the coyote never did an environmental study to gauge where he was. He spent all this time in empowerment. He spent all his time running in the desert, dehydrated, faint. I don't know whether you lost it. I want to remind you again, 71 years chasing after this road run. And y'all forgot, let me give it to you again until it catches up to you. In the desert. He could have expended that energy, that momentum, that strength. I need you to hear me very carefully. Instead of using it to chase the roadrunner, he could have used it to get out the desert. God, y'all not saying nothing to me. His energy was on the wrong thing. You cannot, I want you to please write this down, type it in caps, you will never make your best relationship decisions in a desert place. You don't know what you want. You're just trying to survive. 
You can't make a roadrunner into a housemaker. Y'all already know the remix of that. I'm trying to, come on, we in church. Let's, let, let's stay with the theme. <laughs> you gotta stop chasing the wrong stuff and chasing the wrong people. Many of you are not chasing a person. You're chasing an idea, chasing a position, chasing a title. And I've got to ask you, if God wanted you to have it, why is it running from you? If it is ordained, why are you completely burnt out with something that's supposed to be a blessing? God, I should open the doors of the church right here. How are you completely empty on something that's supposed to be anointed? If God came, and he did, for you to have life and have it more abundantly, how is your whole life wrapped around that thing? And then when you don't have that thing, you feel like you have lost your entire life while God is sitting there. And so God gets offended as to how it is you act like you can't go on because you don't have it and he's tapping you on the shoulder saying, but you got me. God, I need some people in the room that had to do a reality check that even after you lost the job, lost the marriage, lost the house, had to downsize your finances, you were able to testify, after all that I've been through, I still got my joy. Because this joy that I have, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. I may not have a million dollars, I may not live in a mansion, I may be by myself, but when you see me, you gonna find a smile on my face. Why? Because I found Jesus. And I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. Because can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. You spending so much energy chasing the wrong thing. Chasing the wrong people. Chasing the wrong idea. I need you now in Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, I want to unpack this and, uh, and then we'll move forward. Watch what happens in Acts chapter 8. I'm in verse 26. For those of you who are just logging on, Acts uh, chapter 8, verse 26. Watch this. The angel of the Lord said to Philip, I need y'all to look at it. Please look at it. Don't take my word for it, please. I need you to look at it. Your Bible been looking for you all week. Come on, look at it. Uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 26. The angel of the Lord said to Philip, go where? Go where? Come on now. Where? Go south to the road. Watch this. And then what? It, what's the definition of it? it says, the desert road. It's getting ready to blow your mind. The Spirit of the Lord directed Philip to go in the desert. Some of y'all not going to like this, but I got to give it to you anyway. Sometimes, hear me very carefully, it is the Spirit that puts you in a desert. Sometimes the Spirit puts you in a desert. Why, Pastor? So all the distractions can dry up. You know you are in a desert place when you become more focused on what you need to do to develop and enhance you and you stop worrying about what other people are doing around you and you got to figure out how am I going to survive in this? It ain't the devil that put you in it. The Spirit drove you to the desert. Sometimes God allows you to go in the desert, hear me, so that you can discover what you can live without. God, I, I need, I'm preaching good right through here. Sometimes God will let stuff dry up all around you and you don't even know how you're going to sustain yourself. But you got to understand, it's in the middle of this that I find out who Jehovah Jireh really is. And I am a desert survivor. 
is in the desert. When you feel like you get ready to die, then God gives you your reason to live. And I'm, I'm talking to those of you who have lived through some desert experiences and just when you were getting ready to throw in the towel, God had to in fact drop something on you and tell you, you ain't gonna die over that. It's still something greater I got in store for you. I'm, I'm not talking to mealy mouth pushover believers. I'm, I'm talking to those who had to live between the deep blue sea and those who were between a rock and a hard place and just before you were about to collapse, God gave you CPR and said, come back to life. You got to thank God for your desert place. In the desert, he's in the desert place. Watch this, that God put him in. I, I, I know it's going to sound strange to your ears, uh, to your mouth, uh, but I, I, I need you to just say it because it's going to take a weight off of you. Just 50 of you in the room that got enough crazy faith to declare it. Would you just say out loud, God put me in this. I, I know that sounds crazy. I, I know that's strange, but can I just give relief to somebody in here? If God put me in it, he already got a way for me to get out of it. God, God put me in this. Um, and he's uh, in the desert, God's man. He had no reason to be there other than the Holy Spirit put the GPS to go in the desert. And while he's in the desert, he happens on a man uh, that's coming from Jerusalem that just left 730 service. Um, and this guy is a high-ranking White House official. He's a secretary of treasury. And here's what's amazing, ladies and gentlemen, is that this Ethiopian, African, eunuch who is over the money for the entire kingdom I need you to hear this very carefully is, um, is riding in the chariot and the man of God is walking you got to be very careful God help me to preach it right you got to be very careful not to gauge where you are with God by your position ah there's a Dorado said there's always going to be greater and lesser uh, but you can't be in competition with other people uh, because you think because of what they drive it they in a better place than you sometimes it is the grace of God that don't have you in a vehicle that would drive you crazy what does it profit a man gain the whole world and to lose his soul this secretary of treasury he has me but doesn't have meaning. Woe unto you to have money but have no mission. For you to have investments but to have no inspiration. And this man who is Secretary and Treasurer working for the Queen of Candace, watch this, he's reading the book of Isaiah while riding in the chariot. He's reading the Bible while in the chariot. The man who works at the White House, the man that got Pentagon clearance, the man, watch this, who's able to go to all of the soirees, he reading the Bible. And the man of God is walking in the desert. And something strange happens that I wanted you to be aware of. I'm in verse 29. I'm still in the book of Acts. Watch this. The Spirit of the Lord now says to Philip, chase the chariot. Do y'all see that in your Bible? The Spirit of the Lord says, chase the chariot. Now, the reason why this is important is, um, is Philip was not running. He was walking until the Holy Spirit told him to run. Just give a mess you up. I want to just say to 70 of you, don't chase after nothing God didn't tell you to go after. 
Oh, God, that, 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 that's all I was trying to tell you right there, is that if the Holy Spirit didn't tell you to go after it, you better sit your behind down and wait until God gives you the green light. I am not chasing after nothing or nobody that God didn't give me the ordinance to go after. I don't know where you are, but there are 50 y'all in this room that know I'm going after something uh, because I remember when David inquired of the Lord, should I pursue? And the Lord said, if you go after it, you shall recover all. And I believe that for somebody in this room. God said, if you go after what you've been fighting for uh, this month, you shall recover all. If you ain't been going for nothing, don't shout with us. But if you believe everything I lost in 2016, 2017. If I go after it, I shall recover all. And the Spirit told him, Phil, go after it. Hallelujah. I feel glory coming now. And Philip starts running after a chariot that is being drawn by horses. And here's the miracle that nobody ever gives any attention to. And Philip catches up with it. Oh God, I can't hear nobody in here. He's a natural man on two legs. And he's able to catch up with horses. Hallelujah. I'm telling you that when God gives you an assignment, the strength that you're going to be able to exercise will be unfathomable to carnal and mortal man. They're not going to be able to understand how you're able to catch up with stuff that was supposed to pass you. But you got to make up in your mind, if God be for me, then who can be against me? I came to tell 30 of you this morning, you can really catch up with folk that thought they were smarter than you and better than you and more sophisticated than you simply because God said, go after it. Philip ran up to the chariot. And what is amazing is the chariot is moving at top speed. And Philip catches up with it. Hallelujah. And he's able to catch up with it at such a pace that he's able to see what the eunuch is reading. God help me in here. He sees, he's reading the book of Isaiah. How God says you get ready to catch up. Hallelujah. With people who you used to look up to only to discover they don't even know how much they need you for the next chapter of their life. I need you to look at your neighbor, tell them people gonna be careful. Look at your neighbor, tell them people gotta be careful how they treat me because they don't even understand how bad they need me. There is an assignment on my life that is to bless influential people. I'm not jealous of them. I'm not in competition. I am anointed to help them. And I came to tell some of you, get yourself together. Because somewhere this month, God is going to open the door for you to speak into the life of somebody with influence. He catches up to him. And he's asking him, Do you know what you read? God, I can't hear nobody in here. I'm keeping up the pace because I'm so committed to wanting you to be better that I run with you even when you have no direction. I'm going to stick with you until you find yourself. I'm going to stay on your pace until you put them jaws down. I believe in you even when you don't believe in yourself and God told me to tell 80 of you I am assigning somebody who's gonna run with you for the race is not given to the swift or to the strong but to those that endure to the end and Philip said do you know what you read? Said, how can I know unless somebody explains it to me? 
My time is almost up. I think y'all lost it. He, he just coming out of church. He's reading the book of Isaiah, which means y'all not gonna like it. That he's trying to make sense of the sermon he just heard in church. So he decided to read Isaiah on the way home because the sermon ain't make no sense. And somebody had to help him understand the word of God. Oh, God. God says, don't dismiss people too early just because they're not on your same spiritual level. If they got a desire to learn, God help me, then the chase is going to be after it. Ladies and gentlemen, too many of you have become dismissive of people because their understanding of the word of God is as deep as yours. God said, I gave you that knowledge so that you can instruct other people, not so you can talk down to people. Says, I'm chasing you. Why? I'm chasing this eunuch. And I need y'all to hear it because he's carrying something. I'm not chasing him because he got money. I'm chasing him because he's carrying the word. Hallelujah. I, I'm here for just a few remnant who are in this room who don't even understand that there's stuff coming for you. I ain't talking about negative stuff. Positive stuff is coming in your direction. Pastor, why? Because they see I'm carrying something. God, if you only recognize your value, if you only recognize your worth, if you only recognize the weight of glory that's on your life, you would understand why folk keep trying to get in your space. But 15 of you, hallelujah, not only are people coming after you, demonic properties are chasing you because of what you are carrying. Robbers never go after empty banks. God help me, but because you are full of potential, that's why the enemy wants to in fact kill you. But I came to tell you, you shall not die, but you shall live to see the salvation of the Lord. And here's your frustration. You don't even know what you carry. Talking to those of you that are carrying something. And I feel something on my life. I feel something that's weighing on me. I feel something that separates me from everybody else. But nobody will tell me what it is. So he said to Philip, the eunuch did, come up. Come up and sit with me and teach me. Hallelujah. You are going to be surprised who God sends to upgrade you. God, I am. God, for those of you who are listening to me, who believe you're carrying something, God said, prepare yourself. Because this year you are about to live at another level. This year I am going to exceed your expectation and catapult you into another dimension of greatness. Get ready for the upgrade. Hallelujah. I, I feel something getting ready to break right through here. I'm flying on the plane the other day. I'm out flying on the plane the other day. I am, I'm sitting by myself without warning. The stewardess says, if, can you please move your bag off this seat? I said, sure, I'll, I'll move my bag. Why? Why? The door's already closed. Ain't nobody else coming on. So there, there, there is somebody sitting in the back. Hallelujah. Because somebody didn't show up, we're going to upgrade them. God, I, I, I wish I could feel somebody in this room. God told me to tell you, a seat just been cleared. Somebody didn't show up for where they're supposed to be. And God is about to upgrade you. If anybody asks you, What's the matter with me? 
Tell them I'm saved. I'm sanctified. God, I can't hear nobody. And I'm running for my life. I, I, I ain't talking to those of y'all on Match.com and Christian Single. I, I'm talking to those of y'all that are God chasers. That make up in your mind early in the morning. Will I seek after him? If you came chasing God, would you open up your mouth and give him glory like I gotta get him? Hallelujah. My time is almost up. But I'm a God chaser. I got to chase them because there's some stuff going on with me I don't understand. I got to chase them because there's some stuff I'm carrying that makes absolutely no sense. But God said, if you come after me, you are going to find me. If you knock, I will answer. If you call on me, I will speak back to you. If Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you let me in, I'll come in and I'll sup with you. All week long, you've been chasing a check, chasing a promotion, chasing a job, chasing a man, chasing a woman. And you come to church and make up in your mind, cross your legs, fold your arms, twist your lips, roll your eyes, as if God ain't worth chasing. But I'm going after him today. I said, I'm going after him today. If there's anybody like me who just want to catch up with God today, I need you right where you are. Would you lift up that hand and open up your mouth? I'm going after him. Hallelujah. Whatever you do, please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. I can't hear any worshipers. I need you to open up your mouth. I need you to cry out and die, God. Please. Hallelujah. I want a God. Hallelujah. I wish you would lift up your voice a little bit louder. I want God. Hallelujah. I want God. Or oh, y'all don't want him. I wish you were desperate for him. I, I want God. Hallelujah. I need you to cry out loud. You only got 10 seconds left. He is the air I breathe. Without him, I am nothing. With, without him, I would fail. I want God. Hallelujah. Would you lift up that hand, please? Hallelujah. I want God. I want God. Y'all don't want him. Maybe it's just me. But I want God. Hallelujah. My time is almost up and I, I feel the pulling of the Holy Spirit. I, I want God. Hallelujah. I want that hand lifted for those of you who, who feel like you've fallen away from Him. You become distant from Him. You're not as close to Him as you used to be. Your prayer life has fallen off. Your devotional life has become anemic. Your worship life has become abandoned. But today I want to renew my vows with God that I'm with him for better or for worse. In sickness and in health, richer or for poorer. I want him forsaken all others. He is my only God. Come on, God chasers. Wherever it is that you are in this room, and the day you make it up in your mind, I'm coming back to God now. I can't live by myself. I can't do this on my own. I'm coming back to God now. If that's where you are, I need you to lift up that voice. I don't want to be in a backslidden condition. I don't want to be outside of His grace. I'm coming back to God now. Hallelujah. Come on, lift that hand and lift up your voice. I'm coming back to him. I'm coming back to him. This ain't how I'm supposed to be living. This isn't the plane I'm supposed to be on. Hallelujah. 
I'm coming back to God. I don't know what happened, but I lost my way. My focus got off. But today, I'm coming back. I was raised better than this. I know better than this. I'm coming back to God. <laughs> that's who you are, that's where you are. I want you to clap your hands and give him glory even now. Come on, I can't hear you. I say give, give him glory, give him praise. I really hope y'all were gonna do better than that. First Corinthians 15. Verse 55. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? You may be seated now. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? I want to preach for a little while today using as a subject I'm not feeling like myself. I'm not feeling like myself. Given the state of drug abuse in uh, this nation, USA could very well serve as an acronym for the uncontrollable state of addiction. While America constitutes just 5% of the world's population, I need you to hear this, America constitutes 5% of the world's popul population, we consume 75% of all medication. In 2020, there were enough prescriptions written to medicate every American adult for four hours. It's egregious that 52 million of our citizens, 52 million of our citizens over 12 have used prescription drugs in their lifetime. Just in the last 30 days, 6.1 million people have popped unprescribed pills. In the last 30 days, 6.1 million people have popped unprescribed pills. 2.1 million Americans suffer from addiction to pain relievers. 467,000 are on heroin and 70,000 of them live in Atlanta. Yet the Department of Health and Human Services seem to be reticent to declare that we are in an epidemic. There are a whole lot of people who can hear my voice today who are in pain. And there are a whole lot more who are trying to escape pain. As recently as 2014, the United States convened a caucus on international narcotics control where Dr. Nora Volkar made the case that there has to be a balance found between confronting the negative impact of opiate abuse but also finding safeguards for the critical role that opiates play on reducing human suffering. The scientific community has a responsibility between providing maximum relief from suffering while minimizing associated risk and adverse effects. Karl Marx cynically exclaimed that, that Christianity was an opiate for the oppressed. 
We keep prescribing praise, but not addressing pain. So we want people to clap, we want them to shout, we want them to dance, but we don't have anything when the clap ends, when the Hammond stops playing, when the usher stop fanning. The woman with the issue of blood kept getting prescriptions, but instead of getting better, she got worse. Many of us, when we hear the woman with the issue of blood address, we only talk about her blood, but never deal with her cramps. There's something to be said of people who only want to compartmentalize your pain as if you are only suffering at one level. Most people are only comfortable with the pain they can see, but not the pain that, they, that you feel. I read a meme the other day that says, I'm sick of being celebrated for being strong. I want to be able to not have to be strong. I want to be able to be at peace. I want to feel better because I'm tired of being in pain. I'm talking to somebody who feels that warm trickle of a tear coming through your eyes because the pain has become so overwhelming. Pain is coming in so many different directions that you don't even know where to start and you don't know where it started. Isn't it amazing that people ask you how you're doing and without thinking about it you say fine when you're not? I'm talking about church folk. I'm blessed and highly favored. I don't doubt that, but you in pain. You're in pain because this ain't where you thought you'd be in this season of your life. You're in pain because you never imagined life with mom gone. You're in pain because you had no idea 16 months ago you would be considered non-essential. You are in pain because you had no idea the children you raised resent you. You are in pain because you can't believe you the only one watching worship in your house. You are in pain because you can't find support when you're there for everybody else. You're in pain because you pray but don't ever hear nothing. You're in pain because you did what they told you to do but you're still stuck. You're in pain because you try to eat right but still won't lose the weight. It's a different kind of pain. Several factors are likely to have contributed to the severity of the current prescription drug abuse problem. They include the drastic increase in the number of prescriptions written and the number of prescriptions dispensed. There has been a partnership between general practitioners and pharmaceutical companies to keep you on meds. The aim of America's health care is not for your healing. It is for sustained sickness. I am coming into agreement with you of believing that this is the summer that I get total healing for every area of my life. I do not want to maintain a discomfort. I do not want to adjust to being broken. I do not want to fit in to being maladjusted. I declare this summer will not end without complete healing happening to every aspect of my body. And if you are not a partner in my healing, you are a partner to my sickness. We would be derelict. We would be derelict to ignore the greater social acceptability 
for the medicating of America's young people. America's children begin getting pumped drugs in elementary school. and There is no end because it now starts in fourth grade. You taking pills till you in the retirement home from Oxycontin, Vicodin, have become as much a part of America's culture as apple pie. I remember when it is that when I was growing up, when you got sick, they would send you to the nurse's office and the drug they gave you was lay down for a minute. <laughs> You was back in class by the next period. Your mother had to bring you ginger ale. Y'all ain't saying nothing. The same meds are being found in the systems of those being spoon fed and those who have been labeled in special aid. I want to say this and I want you to hear it. Pain does not know an age. does not know an age. So we now have elementary school kids committing suicide. Middle schoolers who are cutting themselves. Grandparents who are now drowning in depression. Pain does not know an age. Pain doesn't just affect knees. It's not just hips. It's not just necks. Pain impacts hearts. It impacts minds. But God had you to log on today because God needed you to know you will live beyond the pain. And the grace of God is going to make you free from pain. I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm telling you, you cannot live and not know pain. I better say that to you again. You cannot live and not know pain. It is a part of the odyssey of our existence. It makes us who it is that we are. The turning styles of your life was the benchmark of painful moments. I remember when this happened. I remember when I was going through this. I remember that dark night of the soul. I know the season I didn't want to get out of the bed. It was painful, but it was necessary. The problem that plagues many patients is the element of physical dependence that kicks in when you want to stop, but you can't. I am amazed. I've been in church my whole life. I'm amazed, Jonathan, when we were growing up, they would tell you, come put your cigarettes on the altar. They would do altar calls for those who are contending with alcoholism. They would have special deliverance services for those that were on cocaine and marijuana, but they never called for deliverance for those who were addicted to painkillers. Because we could deal with the alcoholics on the corner. Could deal with the drug addicts in the nightclub. But we never want to address the addicts on the usher board. Never want to deal with the addicts that are on the deacon board. Never want to deal with the addicts. Can I go there in the pulpit? There are two million people addicted to painkillers. And many of them are saved. And, and, and we get connected to it and don't even know that we can be free from it. The brain responds to the presence of the prescription with the nerve cells uh, discontinuing its normal function. And so what happens with addiction for those who are addicted to painkillers, I need y'all to hear this, is the best thing I'm going to tell you today. The body is healed, but the mind won't accept it. Did you hear what I just said? The body is healed, but the mind won't accept it. A few years ago, I uh, went to my dentist's office for a root canal. They had applied Novocaine. But when the doctor went into my mouth, here it is, I instinctively jumped. 
He said, Jamal, you got to sit still. He said, you can't feel anything, but your mind is anticipating pain. And it's anticipating pain you can't feel. Your body is responding to what you think is going to happen when you've already been numb to it. I'm speaking to somebody sitting on that couch. Stop reacting to what you think the devil got authority over. You already got peace in that area, but you keep jumping as if God had healed you from it. I, I need somebody by faith. Somebody by faith. I need you to declare out loud, I feel better already. Oh my God. Do, do you know what that just opened up in your spirit? I need you to lay hands on yourself and declare by faith, I feel better already. I don't care what the doctor says. I don't care what my medical history is. I don't care how long I've been dealing with it. I feel better already. The saints said I feel better ever since I laid my burdens down. You know, when Jesus was hanging on that cross, I need you to see what happened. When Jesus is hanging on the cross, the Roman government went into autopilot. He's hanging on the cross. I need you to see it. He's hanging on the cross. And they presumed that the only way to control a radical black man was to put him on drugs. He's already on the cross. And they're trying to give him something to numb the pain. There are so many of our black men who are trying to numb themselves from everything that they're dealing with. I'm talking about your returning veteran father. I'm talking about your returning citizen brother. I'm talking about your unemployed son have been trying to find ways to medicate their pain. But God said healing is getting ready to happen in the life of every man in your family who is dealing with unaddressed pain. I know some of y'all ain't gonna shout about it because there's nothing tangible connected to it. But God said if you give me glory, I break the pressure out of the men in your family. If you praise me, every suicidal thought that is in the men in your family is about to be broken. If you scream louder, I cancel the spirit of sabotage that is in your son in the name of Jesus. How? Hallelujah. I dare you to put your son's name on that screen, your brother's name on that screen, your father's name on that screen. Y'all been shouting over cars for a year. Will you shout for your son's deliverance? Will you shout for your brother's breakthrough? Will you holler for your father's freedom that they are not going to be codependent? And the drugs I'm talking about ain't necessarily heroin or cocaine. They are addicted to gambling, addicted to women, addicted to cars, addicted to money, addicted to joints. Whatever it is that they use to anesthetize the pain, the power of the Holy Ghost is going to break whatever addiction is on that man's life. Hallelujah. Luke. Luke is the doctor who became a disciple. Luke is a doctor that became a disciple. But it's actually Paul who gives us redress to the present day pharmaceutical industry. When he writes to the church at Corinth, in the 15th chapter, oh death, where is your stench? 
God, I can't hear nobody. Look at the nerve of Paul to taunt death. To say, I know you're trying to kill me, but it ain't going to work. I know you're trying to take me down, but is that all you got? You think that what you threw at me was going to finish me? It only made me stronger. It only made me better. It only made me trust him more. I needed that for whatever didn't kill me. Only made me Your pain is a part of the process. How much pain did Jesus have on that cross with holes in his hands? How much pain with a crown of thorn on his head? How much pain with being pierced in the side? How much pain being whipped in his back and you can't sleep? Because Negroes don't like you? You think you can't make it? Because you lost that previous job? Sometimes, and some of y'all ain't going to shout about it, for five of y'all that can keep it real, some of my pain wasn't from the devil. Some of my pain came from God. And I had to tell him, though you slay me, yet will I trust you. I will bless the Lord. It is my God assignment to break the addiction of painkillers in the month of June. And in this first installment, I want to give you three pills that I think will subdue your pain. The first pill that I want to give you is a tough one to swallow. But it is a necessary one for believers. The first pill you need to get through painkillers, hear this, is patience. Trouble don't last always. Maya Angelou said that every cloud runs out of rain. Tough times don't last, but tough people do. Isaiah said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Big Mama said, he may not come when you want him to come, but he's an on-time God. While I'm down here waiting, Lord, search my heart. The first pill you got to take is patience. The second pill you got to take, hear this, is prayer. I got to talk to God and let him know, Lord, here is your child. You know of what it is that I'm dealing with. You know that this is too much for me to bear. You know that this is more than what I can handle. I gotta have patience. I gotta learn how to pray. Here's the thing when I'm waiting for the studio to wake up is I gotta praise him. I will bless the Lord at all times. Can I tell the devil something? There is nothing more powerful than a wounded worshiper when you can praise him while you're in pain when you can bless him when you don't feel like it when you can give him glory when you're dealing with agony I don't want you to shout cause you feel good I want you to shout cause it's about to get better better, better, better better, better, better Give somebody a high five and tell them let's get ready and get better. Before this summer is over, I'ma feel better in my hands, better in my feet, better in my back, better in my knees. And I can't wait till the battle is over, but I shout now like it's already better. Like it's already better. Like it's already.
The amazing thing I learned from the woman with the issue of blood, the, the doctor just kept writing her prescriptions and she never balked, she never hesitated, she never pushed back. Whatever it is that the doctor told her to get, she would do it, would never pause, would never hesitate. The average American average American pays $177, $177 above what it is that your insurance covers for your medication. $177. I'm trying to figure out how do you trust the doctor more than you do the healer? Y'all didn't hear what I just said. How do you trust the doctor more than you do the healer? I'm going to challenge those of you that can and will. I don't want you to balk. I don't want you to push back. I want every person to give a seed of 177 in this moment for somebody in your family that's contending with pain. Somebody in your family who's struggling through addiction. Even if that somebody is you. I'm going to challenge every single one of you. Give a seed today. This is above your tithe, above your offering. A seed of 177. I want you to sow it. I want you to believe God for it that every area of pain that exists in my family is going to be healed before this month is over. God help me, I feel the praise team, the rest of y'all sitting on it. I said every member of my family that's dealing with pain is going to be healed in these next 30 days. Y'all ain't saying nothing. No matter what the pain is, this is the month of their healing. This is the month of their breakthrough. The month of their deliverance. There is no disease God can heal. I want you right now, all of our giving apps are available on the screen. Push pay, text to give, GiveLify, mailing it in. But I want to challenge every single one of you. Give a seed of 177, 177. I'm sowing that seed on behalf of my mother today. I want her to be completely pain free. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. I want my mother to be completely pain free. I'm sowing that seed on her behalf on this morning. I'm believing that God is going to do something amazing. There is a deeper uh, prevailing pain. It's not in knees or elbows or hips or chest or shoulders or neck. It's the pain of the soul knowing that your soul is ever reaching but never landing i don't know where you are your soul is in pain because you've been out of church for a long time your soul is in pain because you don't have covering your soul is in pain because you are not united in a place of fellowship where you can grow and expose your pain without being judged i need you to know the church is not a museum it's a hospital this ain't where you come to look, it's where you come to get healed. And those of you that need healing for your soul, I want to be your pastor. I want Jesus to be your Lord. I want new birth to be your church. This is your month that you're going to be free from pain. Did y'all hear what I just said? I said, this is the month that you're going to be free from pain. I believe it for you. I believe it for your family. I believe it for everything and everybody that's connected to you. God bless you. I want you to stay tuned. We got some stuff that we need to show you. But next Sunday, I need you to meet me in this parking lot. Because if this is how we acting in a studio, when we go outside, it's going to be crazy, y'all. Let's just shout our way out. Come on. They have some scars. 